How are we doing there, Richard? Y'all set? Okay, praise the Lord. That was good. (sighs) Open your Bibles then with me to Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 6. We are going through the book of Matthew on Sunday mornings, and we have been spending the past 10 weeks now in this model prayer that Jesus had given to his disciples to teach them how to pray. And the Lord has been uh, teaching us how to pray too. And today we are in verse 13, and we're going to be taking a look at just the first half of that verse. Let's open with some prayer. Heavenly Father, you are our protector. You're our provider. Your name is great, Lord. Your name is great to be praised, for your name is your character, God. You can't go against anything that is in your character. Your name is solid. It's, it's separate. It's established. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would bless us in your word, that Jesus, you would teach us. Holy Spirit, I pray you would empower us. Heavenly Father, I pray you would smile upon us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, all the way back up to the top here. There's been crime, crime, crime happening in our world, isn't there? I went online last night to just find a few headlines of the different kinds of crimes going on in America, and there was just too many to pick from. There's crimes of murder, and there's crimes of theft, and arson, and, and stealing. And in Chicago, I read this morning that Mayor Lightfoot has declared a crime pandemic so it's become a pandemic like the COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. That crime down, if you guys know where the Miracle Mile is, you know where that's at downtown? It's beautiful, it's, it's wonderful, it's tall, it's majestic, it's where all the money is. You walk down there and you can just feel the green everywhere. And there's crime galore down that street. People just walking in the stores, stealing stuff, burning things down. Our world is full of evil. Our world is blind, blind to the fact that evil is surrounding us, calling things that are evil okay, and calling things that are okay evil. It's all turned upside down. Evil literally is running amok in our world. But listen to 1 John 5, 19. We know that that, um, we are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. The whole world is under the sway of the evil one. He's the reason why people are being driven by the world system. If he wasn't there to manipulate the world system and bring into play all that it has to offer, then people would not be driven that way. Jesus said in John 17, 15, I do not pray that you should... Uh, take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. So God's desire is that we live here in the middle of all this, but being kept from the evil one, from Satan. What is um, commonly known as the Lord's Prayer really is not the Lord's Prayer at all. John 17, um, uh, Jesus is actually praying and you could say that that is the Lord's Prayer. That's what we just read there, John 17, 15. That's part of the Lord's Prayer. What's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 isn't the Lord's Prayer at all. Matthew chapter 6 is the Lord's dictation of how to pray. It's his model for prayer. It's his bullet points. He said, teach us how to pray. He didn't teach them how to pray by By praying, he taught them how to pray with bullet points. This is what every single prayer needs to entail. When you are learning how to pray from this model, you're going to touch on every single human need that every person is requiring. Now, this model of prayer begins in verse 9, in this manner, therefore, pray. So this is Jesus saying that this is the way we should pray. Now, it's vitally important, therefore, that we learn how to pray. Jesus had given us this so we would learn. 
not learn how to recite this, which is important because when you learn how to recite this, then you can flow it through your mind while you're praying. You can say, um, you don't have to do it even in order. You can mix it up. But as you're praying, you can say to yourself, have I covered all the bases? Have I touched on every area of this model prayer? Jesus gives us this prayer, and it, it is driven with six different bullet points, six different areas that we are to build our prayer on. The first bullet point is in verse 9 of chapter 6, and this concerns God's person. So you're just talking about who God is. You're, you're lifting up your voice to him and declaring who he is by his word. You're the wonderful provider. You're my healer. That you, you are mad, mad, majestic. You can go into the Psalms and you can read all kinds of Psalms about God's person. The second verse in, in, in verse 10 is praying about God's purpose. His purpose is that his kingdom would come. His will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. His purpose is that his rule would be over our lives. And in, ver, in verse uh, 11, um, the third point is God's provision. Give us this day our daily bread. That when you are praying, you pray, God, you're my provider. Everything that I have is because you have given it to me. I pray, Lord, that everything that I need, not necessarily everything I want. Like when my mother taught me how to pray, I thought, right on, right on. I love this prayer. And I sat down with my mother, let's pray. And I said, I said, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. I pray in Jesus' name that I would have a yellow mini bike tomorrow morning. And my mom said, well, how do you know that God is going to provide that as a need? Maybe he doesn't think you need that. I thought, oh, bummer, you know. And then, and fourthly, God's pardon. This, this is an area that we, we have developed last week. And then God's protection. Um, God's protection is today. And then that's in verse 13. And God's preeminence in verse 13b. God's pardon just to bring you back into remembrance of that, was two areas that we need to develop for forgiveness. And remember that the Lord forgives us judicially. What that means is that there is a law broken and then there is a penalty for breaking the law and God is a just judge and judicially he has got to judge that for what it is. Jesus forgives us judicially, because he paid the penalty for my sin. Now, that's nothing I can do. I can't add to that. I can't subtract from that. All I can do is receive it as a free gift. But you see, Jesus isn't talking here about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, as if it's judicial, because it's not judicial. It's relational. Just like if you and I have a relationship with someone that's broken and there's something that happened, we want to go to them and mend it up, that our relationship has been mended. And the Lord is saying in these verses, if you remember last week, he says, look, you can ask me all you want to, to forgive your debts, but it ain't happening until you make it right with everybody else. In other words, he's saying, he's not being mean there. He's actually teaching us something there because this is not to be something that I do just haphazardly, but it's something I do as a lifestyle with God and with people. That's what we learned last week. Now, the verse uh, 12, let me see here. Um, yes, uh, moving on. Okay, so let me read this prayer then in its totality in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This morning, we are looking at the fifth element of this prayer, God's protection. His protection takes us somewhere. His protection takes us to the Lord's gem in verse 13. And if you remember, this is a play on words. Gold's gem was, be, was started by Joe Gold in Venice, California in 1965. And it's one of the baddest to the bone 
gems you can go to. Get Gold's gem shirts even here in Key West, you'll see them wearing them. But there's a Lord's gem shirt. Anybody ever seen it? It looks just like the Gold's gem shirt, except it says Lord's gem on it. And the Lord is bringing us into that place. The Lord's gem. It's a place where we are to exercise ourselves. We are to exercise ourselves as Timothy was told by Paul in verse 7 of chapter 4. But reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself towards God godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of life that is now and that which is to come. So let's hit the gem this morning. Are you ready? Don't put too many plates on. You don't want to hurt yourself now. Only put as much as you need. Am I right? Amen. Okay, so the verse that we begin with is this in verse 13. Go into the gem. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, many have a contention with this verse. They think this. Does God really lead me into temptation? Does, does he really need me to ask him not to do that? Um, and when I'm being tempted, is it because God has caused it all? Well, first, we need to understand what the word temptation means. The word temptation in Greek is pyrasmus, and it means to test something. It means to put something under stress to test it. It is not a negative word or a positive word, and it's not leading anybody anywhere. It's a test. That's all it is. Like when I had, as a young man, I, was, I got certified as a welder when I was a young man. Now, as you, to get certified in California to be a welder, you have to take two pieces of steel and you weld them together vertically. It's hard to do, you know. You got to know what you're doing. And then they take that bar and then they put it in a vise or a press and they bend it like a horseshoe. And if that cracks anywhere, then you fail the test because the weld had flux in it. But if it bends all the way around, you've passed the test, you see. That is what temptation is. That's what this word is driving at, that God is testing us to see what's inside. And as we are being tested, if we crack, we fail. That's all this word means. Now, it is to try or to test, is to see what's inside of us to see if we have been going to the gem or not, you see. That's what it means. Now, with any uh, legitimate trial or any legitimate test, there's going to be the possibility that you're going to either pass it or you're going to fail it. So it's important to know that God never, ever, ever, ever tempts someone. God never does that. God never tempts with evil, and evil can never touch God. There is nothing to do. He has nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 13, I think you've got that on your thing, right? Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. The word by here, there, now in the next verse, in verse 14, we're going to take a look that, at that in a second. Each verse has this word by. And the word is different. There, there are two totally different meanings of the word by in, in English. This first one is apo, and the other one's hupo. And this one is to draw someone away, to separate someone. That's what that word means, by. No one is ever tempted by God to draw them away and separate them from him. Ever. Doesn't that fly against everything in the Bible? No, we are never separated in Romans chapter 8. Nothing separates us ever. And God is not going to say, nothing's going to ever separate you unless I tempt you to be separated. That's ridiculous. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God to be drawn away from him. What is being said here is this. God, in no way, in no way, ever directly or indirectly, is involved whatsoever with that temptation to draw you away from him, ever. God is only involved with the test 
Do you get it? He's only involved with the test so you can see what's inside of you, you see. The test, you see, is that. Have you been going to the gym or not? That's all it is. You want to be able to do your, are, are you, a, are you a, a, a worker that does construction? Like, like I am, that's what I do. I love to do that. You get to be my age, I tell you this, if you don't go to the gym, you can't do your job anymore. You can't. Because you're going to get, I get out there, you know, I, I, I like, as a lot of guys do, I don't know why this is, but the typical big up in the small legs, it's just terrible. I, I, I need to start doing my legs. And I, and I have upper body strength, which is great. And I use it almost every day, and I'm like, oh, am I so glad I'm going to the gym. I can do this job. But then I have to use my legs, and they're like noodles. And I can't do what I need to do because I've not been going to the gym. And something happens with us when we are in this test, you see. When we are in this test. But remember that our God never, never tempts us to go sin or never tempts us ever to go away from him. He's holy. Leviticus 19.2 says, speak, all, speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, am holy. That's who he is. 1 Samuel 2.2, no one is holy like our God, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. He is holy. He is pure. He's without blemish. Psalm 99.9 says this, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. And everything God does is holy. Anything to do with evil has nothing to do with God. So back to James 1.13, Let no one say when he was tempted, I am tempted by God, which means the word by there is to separate, to draw away from God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. He can't. And nor does he tempt anyone else. It's totally foreign to him. Did you ever, have you ever been asked the question, is there anything that God can't do? You can say yes. There are some things that God cannot do. And this is one of them. He cannot do evil. It's impossible. It's impossible for him to go do that. So where's this temptation coming from? Where do you think? We might tend to think one thing, but maybe it's another thing. Hmm. Look at our text, um, the next verse in our text in verse 14. But each one is tempted, now we're getting to the meat of the matter, when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That's where we're tempted. This word by is the other word hoopo. Um, and that word hoopo, let me see here, where is that? That word hupo is not the word that says to draw away, but it means, it means to, um, to, to catch, like you're going to catch a fish, or to trap, like you're going to trap an animal. The word tempt here, to be drawn away, is, uh, is exelco, and it means to drag. It means to trap. It means to go and catch, you see. What pulls us into the bait, the bait is, oh, there's lots of bait, isn't there? But what pulls us into the bait is our desires. What is the bait? Our bait is our own lust for the desire. One person's bait, you see, is not the other person's bait. Everyone's bait is different. It, it, it is exclusive to you. One person's bait might be overspending or overeating. Another person's bait might be overachievement or status symbol. It, it, it's something that, that is a part of you. It's exclusive to you, to your temperament, your upbringing, where you live, how you live. Uh, just to name a few things. There's lots of, of examples of that. But the bait also can change. What was so freely done in your youth and so exciting to you isn't so exciting anymore. Some people's bait might be video games, and you know, video games are okay, but they can become a problem. I mean, can't they? Yeah. And if you've ever seen some video games, they're pretty sinful, you know. And so when you're younger, you might be like, yeah, but then when you get older, you're kind of like, nah. But then there's something else that you go, yeah. 
And it changes, doesn't it? Pogo correctly said, we have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. It's pretty profound. We have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God can't tempt anyone with evil, nor does he tempt any, anyone. But let each one, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own des desires and enticed. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away, meaning that he is putting himself into the hands of the desire. You're putting yourself into the very power of that desire. When you're tempted, and then it, that when you're tempted, you're putting your hand, you're putting yourself into the hands of that thing, that desire that's inside of you. When we put ourselves into the hands of that power, then we are enticed. But God never does that. Never. We do that to ourselves. Then when desire in verse 15 is conceived, first we're tempted with the bait of that desire, and when that desire has conceived and we've given into it, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. So this verse teaches us that sin is not a bunch of acts. It's not sin in Acts, but it's a process. Each sin has a process. It starts with desire, and then it turns into lust, and then it gives birth to sin, and then it grows into death. Now, where do you begin to deal with the process then? Many times we like to deal with the process with lust. So uh, I got to stay away from that thing. I have to, you know, I, I, I need to stay away from the donut shop. I need to, to uh, um, um, bring a credit card with only a $50 limit when I go to the mall or whatever. I got to stay because it's, it's all that. But no, it starts with the desire, not the lust. It starts at the very beginning. It's at the level of dealing with the emotional response to the temptation that we deal most effectively with the desire. It starts before that, you see. Everything your desire craves for in this world can be offered to you. Movies, internet, social media, books, music, my favorite, cable news. Boy, that can lead you into sin, can't it? In your emotions, whew! Start reading that, get all riled up, get all mad. Oh, yeah. A news junkie, oh, you got a, got a fast from cable news. The list can go on and on and on and on, can't it? It's all right there at your fingertips. It's all a baited hook that's waiting for you to bite. That's why James said in verse 15, don't be deceived. And he said it like this, don't be deceived, my dear beloved brethren. Don't be deceived, you guys. I love you. Don't be deceived. God's not doing this. Stop blaming him. Start exercising spiritually, and you're going to overcome that desire. Now, how do we exercise our spiritual muscles? Well, you look at our text in verse 13. Jesus said, do not lead us into temptation. Now, we couldn't be talking about sin because he's not leading us into sin. Because God can't be tempted by sin. Remember what the word temptation means. It's more literally, do not lead us into a trial that's going to lead us away from you. Don't ever test us, God, that you're going to be leading us into a trial that Satan will get a hold of and turn it into a temptation that drives me away from you. Regulate this, God. Keep me. You know, this is just a wonderful inference about going to the gym. You know what happens if you overdo it at the gym? You hurt yourself. You can tear a muscle. But if you go there correctly and you, do, and you do weightlifting, when you weightlift, when you go to the gym, you know what you can do, and then you put a little bit more on. And then you get your friend back there, and he's there to spot you. And then, you, then as you're, you're getting to that place where you can't do anything more, your friend yells at you and makes you feel like a girl. And then you say, push some more. And then, he, then you push a little bit more, and it's that spot right there. That's where you want to get. It takes work to get to that spot. And you know what? We don't want to get to that spot now, do we? That's why you see a bunch of guys in the gym with, yeah, you need a little bit more weight on there, man. 
Or then you see some guys that can't even get the weight up. You're like, you need to get a little bit of weight off of there, man. And then there's this sweet medium, and God knows all about it, where you're at. God doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, hurt us. He wants to help us. Now, that's why in James chapter 1, verse 2, James said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because the trials are there to strengthen you. That's why it's a joy. Now, you know, the new year is going to come around and everybody, all these people are going to go get their memberships at, at the gym, right? And, and you know what they do? You know what people do is by February, they're back to their old ways. They're not, they're not going to the gym. And you see, that, that's where the Lord says in, in chapter 2, count it all joy when you go to the gym. Nobody <laughs> wants to go. I don't want to go to the gym. <laughs> Some people live in the gym. Some people, I think, did you ever go home? <laughs> My boy, I tell you what, when you go to the gym and you walk out of there, then you know why you went. Because there is a feeling you got, man. You can't get anywhere else. There's something about it that just is amazing. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, you see here also another inference here that, we are, that the trials are have, having a purpose. The test has a purpose to strengthen us, to try to see what's inside of us. That's what the Lord did in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, not to draw Jesus away from him, but that the world could see what's inside of him. That's why it happened. Now, it, now what God does in testing us, he is testing us to make us stronger. But what Satan does is he, he, he waits until God is setting you into a test because he, he's constantly doing it, putting us into a test. And then he takes that test and then he throws some bait at you so that you'll possibly bite during the test and then you're going to fail the test. Remember what the bait was for Jesus? You're hungry, turn these loaves of bread and uh, these rocks into bread. That was the temptation. He's dangling, dangling the bait. And Jesus didn't bite the bait, now did he? Nope, he did not. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Can you turn up the AC one notch? I think that we're getting, are you cold? Nobody's cold? Okay, good. I want you all to freeze your um, earlobes off. Okay, good. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces something. There it is. It produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what we are after. Every trial of life, God uses to strengthen, mature, and perfect us. The trial is to strengthen us and strengthen our spiritual muscles. Now, if you plant a tree, a sapling, you'll want to put guide wires on the tr little tree so that when the wind comes, it doesn't knock it over and, and break it. That's why you'll see all these trees on the boulevard in Key West. They put all those new trees up. They put these guide wires down. But if you don't take the guide wires off once the tree's established, the tree will never grow strong because it grows strong as it's being stressed. So as the tree is bending like this, it's like, ah, ah, breaking a little bit. Then when it goes back up, it strengthens itself and strengthens itself. And that little tree will continue to grow tall, but it won't grow fat. That's why you've got to cut the guide wires. You've got to let the wind blow. That's why we are to be strengthened, because there's storms that come, and the wind's going to blow. And when that hurricane hits you, if you've been held safe with the guide wires around you, with no trial, no temptation, no nothing going on around you, when that comes at you, man, you are so weak, you're more apt to fail the test. Without strengthening of the trial, our lives are going to be very, very weak. The trial is there that when the storms of worldly desire come, we can withstand them. 
One day, a man found a cocoon of a butterfly, and he saw a small opening on the little cocoon, and he took his pair of scissors after watching him several hours not being able to come out of the cocoon, and he made a little slit there so the little butter, little critter could come out. And, uh, and the man decided that he was going to do that, and sure enough, the little critter came out, but he was all fat and swollen, and his little wings were all shriveled up. And we continued to watch this little guy and, and thinking, okay, any moment the little wings are going to pop out. But it never did. It spent its whole life waddling around on the ground with little shriveled up wings. He didn't understand that all the juice that's inside of his body, when he squeezed through that little hole, was going to push all the fluid into his little wings. And then that stress was going to cause him to fly. And that's what happens with you and I too, you know. If we don't allow God to set us into tests, we become like that little fat little critter flailing around on the ground and not able, able to fly. We're just not going to have our full capacity of what we could be seeing, what we could be doing in our lives. But if we pass the test, <coughs> if we pass it, you see, you're strengthened by it. You're empowered by it. And then it's time for you to fly. And you're going to experience life on a totally new level. Can you see how powerful this portion of scripture is? In your prayer life, when you're asking God, God, I'm, I'm not exactly a masochist, and I don't really want the trial, but you know, Lord, I understand that as I am praying that God, that today as I'm going through my day, <clears throat> there's going to be trials and temptations all around, and I pray, God, that by your grace, and your power and your help and whatever else you can think of, I am going to pass the test, God, today in Jesus. Name. That's what you're praying in the Lord's Prayer. That's what you're doing. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one because he's the one that is doing all of the bait dangling. Don't, don't lead us into a place where Satan wants to destroy us. You see, this isn't two things here. This is just one thing. This isn't talking about God tempting us. This is about Satan tempting us. About Satan doing that. Don't let Satan have his way in us, but deliver us from the evil one. The trial, you see, the trial that God leads us to has difficulty associated to it now, doesn't it? There's hardship there. There is evil present. It's not God doing it. It's Satan doing it. And if you recall, when Joseph had gone into Egypt, one of the last things that he had said to his brothers who had done so wickedly to him, you see, Joseph passed the test. He didn't give in to Pharaoh's wife. Uh, he didn't give in to all sorts of temptation as a young man. He passed the test, passed the test, passed the test. And evil, 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 bait, bait, bait. He could have hated his brothers. That was a big test, don't you know? When his brothers came and he was going to, and, and they, he, they didn't know who he was, and he could have had them locked up just like he was locked up. Test. But you know what he did? He passed the test. And they didn't get it. How could you have done that before? How could you have, have not acted like that? And he's like, well, because I've been going to the Lord's gem. I've been passing the tests all this time. And when the real test came, I mean, that's what God prepared him for. This is what he said in verse 20 of chapter 50. But as for you, what you meant, what you meant evil against me as for you. But God meant what you were doing as evil as good for me. It was a test. It was a trial. In order to bring it about as it is this day <clears throat> to save many people. The trial strengthens us. Satan uses that trial to bait us, to lead us directly into sin. We are to pray, Lord, do not lead me into the hands of the trial to destroy me. Don't do it, God. Lord, do not lead me into the hands of desire that leads me into sin. Don't do it, God. 
Oh, I wouldn't word to count it all joy when the Lord brings us into, the, into his gem. There is where we're going to get spiritual exercise. That's where we're going to become big bad warriors for the Lord's purpose in his battle. That's where it happens. Now, if you're like me, you're going to say to yourself, and this is in closing, by the way, we've been booking along, haven't we? Doing pretty good. This is what I might be thinking. Uh, you know, this uh, wind is pretty strong, and uh, I don't feel like I could handle that. I'm going to snap. Uh, any moment, I'm going to break. I, I, I can't endure the storm. I can't endure this trial. Uh, Lord, uh, but I have some great news. God always gives you a way out. And every single tr test he gives to you, every one of them, all of them, he's never going to give you a test where he doesn't give you a way out. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overcome you except such as common to man. But God is faithful. In other words, what you're being tested by, plenty of other guys have been tested by. Don't think that you're the only one who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will always give you a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He always gives you a way out. Every time. He's never going to overload you. If you guys have been as a tavernier where the way station is here in the Keys is a tavernier. So you go over the drawbridge, right? And then you got the way station right there. And you all know what the way station's for. That nobody's driving up and down US-1 with an overloaded truck. God is never ever going to let any of his children drive around in the and on the highway of life overloaded ever he's always going to keep the scale exactly right he'll never let it happen now you might be saying okay so i don't really believe it <laughs> I don't think God does that. I, I mean, it sounds good, but I don't experience God giving me a way out. Well, let me ask you this. Okay, put it to the test then. Next time, and I'm just saying that uh, there's going to be a next time when you fail the test. It'll happen. Next time you fail the test, think about the moment before you bit the bait. Think about it. There was a hesitation right there. There was a hesitation that said, think about it. There was a hesitation there where you could have walked down a different road. That is the blessing God gives to you. He always gives you that spot. I, I had a friend that, that shared with me a time when he was a young man and had, had uh, moved far away from home with his family. And he shouldn't have been there, he said. He had been developing this, there, there was something there that was not right. He wasn't in sin, but there was something not right. And he kept on going down that road. And he said, he remembers the day that he was going to go to the DMV to change over his license, the driver's license from the other state to the new state. And while he's driving there, the Holy Spirit so powerfully moved in his heart, he had to come off the freeway. He pulled off and sat there and thought. Because the Lord was saying to him, do not go to the DMV. Go back home. That was it. Don't go to the DMV. Go back home. And he sat there and thought and thought and thought and thought. And he chose, and he did not pass the test. And he told me that that one choice led to a lifetime of trial. His whole life, his whole entire life was moved by that one spot. That's a powerful testimony. A powerful testimony of what happens if you don't pass some tests. But listen to this. Moses, Moses had not passed the test one time. And it was a, it was a heavy, heavy deal. And 
And what happened was the children of Israel were thirsty, and the Lord told Moses, first off, to go over to a rock and tap it with his staff, and water would come out. But the, the test that Moses had here was a test of conveying God's heart. And they were making him upset. <laughs> They were whining and complaining and grumbling and, oh, it was terrible. And, uh, and so Moses, in Numbers chapter 20, so Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and fell on their face and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. They're asking God, what are we going to do here? They're doing it again. Then the Lord said to Moses saying, take your rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation and speak to the rock. Last time he said, strike the rock. This time he said, talk to the rock. <laughs> speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Why? Because speaking is going to convey emotion. I want them to know I'm not mad at them. I love them, and I'm going to take care of them. That's what he wanted to know. So, they, they, uh, and he's going to give them a drink of water and all their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, and he, com and he commanded him. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said, Hear now, you rebels! Must we bring, must we bring, must we bring, must we bring, must you have anything to do with this, Moses? Like, must we bring, must God and I do this together? Moses, I think that you're not passing the test here. Must we bring water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and hit the rock twice. And water came out. The congregation drank. And the Lord said to Moses, Because you did not believe me, to hallowed me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. That, you see, was what happened because he didn't pass the test. Something very heavy happened. The one thing he wanted in life altogether was no longer there. And he was so bummed out in Deuteronomy 3.25, I pray, let me cross over, see the good land before the Jordan, please. I want to see the pleasant mountains of Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Moses was not able to cross over to the Jordan in his physical body. He was not able to be blessed like that. But, let me see here. Moses, the day that he died... Check this out. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab and Moab and Nebo to the top of Mount Pishka, which is across from Jericho. And this is what God did. See, God gives you a way out. He does. Always does. What did he want? He wanted, he wanted to enter. He wanted to see. He wanted to experience in his physical body. Look what God did. This is amazing. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, all the lands of Ephraim and Manasseh, at the land of Judah, as far west as the sea in the south, the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zor. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, I give it to your descendants. And listen, I have caused you to see it. You see what he did? I've caused you to see it. He took him for a ride. I don't really know what that was. How did he take him for a ride? But he took him for a ride. It was not sitting on top of a mountaintop saying, okay, I want you just to look over and you can kind of see the edge of it. He took him for a ride. He says, look, I love you. Come here. Let's go check it out. And he checked it out with him. Is that amazing? He wasn't able to go and cross over into the Jordan physically. But listen to this. Moses was buried in chapter 34 of, of uh, 
of uh, Deuteron Deuteronomy, um, where was that? Of Deuteronomy, yep, chapter 34, he dies. And, uh, and, and then the Bible says no one knows where his grave is. You also see in Jude, uh, Jude verse 9, that the devil and Satan, they fought over the body of Moses. What's all that about? Well, some people believe that one of the two witnesses that are going to be going and witnessing where? In Jerusalem, one of them was Moses. In his physical body. Can you feel what I'm saying? In his physical body, God brought him into Jerusalem. The one thing that he wanted. By his grace, you see. God isn't there to hurt you. He wants to bring fulfillment to you. Even though you might fail the test, his grace is greater than all your sin. Hallelujah. All you need to do is pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. I'm mixing up King James and New King James, sorry. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors <laughs> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen? Let's all stand for the benediction. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and, keep thee. and keep thee. The Lord's face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you rest. Bless one another before you leave. Share testimony with each other if you have one that God has spoke to you. And we'll see you on WebEx tomorrow night or uh, Wednesday night for Hosea chapter... 13. Amen. God bless you all. How about some music, Brother Richard?